Hello, I'm Stacy Martin with the Denver branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 virtual economic uh, evening at the Fed series presentations. The goal is to share with you insights and perspectives on current issues and topics from our district. You, all, you knew, of course, that we have plenty of free resources for classrooms, um, economics, personal finance, career education, and then of course, virtual programs like these. Of course, you can register for additional upcoming webinars in the series, while you have some more fantastic hot topics coming on how the economy uh, is affected by the energy and food fluctuations. And then of course, talking about the impact of COVID-19 on our region and the rest of the economy. These are gonna be presented by our senior economists and then our bank president, Esther George. This evening, there will be plenty of time for questions following each presentation. Please utilize the Q&A button to submit those, and I'll get to as many as we possibly can. So let's get started. Our presenter, one of our presenters tonight is Nick Sly. He's the assistant vice president, Denver branch executive and economist. He works closely with the Denver branch's board of directors and is responsible for briefing Esther George on economic and business activities in the region. He graduated from the University of Northern Iowa with a degree in mathematics and economics and earned his PhD in economics from Michigan State. Nick also has classroom experience as he was an associate professor of economics at the University of Oregon. David Rochevich is a senior economics specialist. His research focuses on energy economics, natural resource economics, climate change, and regional economics. David has a bachelor's degree in finance and economics for the University of Illinois and holds a master's degree in mineral and energy economics from Colorado School of Mines. Of particular interest and a good tie for tonight's presentation, David worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. With that, David, I turn the floor over to you and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, Stacy. So good evening. My name is David Rojevich. I'm a senior economic specialist at the Denver branch of the Kansas City Federal Reserve. And I'm here to present to you on sort of climate change, risk, and economics. So this is sort of an emergent topic, topic in the field of economics and also at the Federal Reserve. Um, and standard disclosures apply. These are, are my views and not the views of the Kansas City Fed. So to start it off, I thought I'd give you an overview of where, we're, where, where I'm going to go with this presentation. Um, so climate change, broad, broad view, rising greenhouse gas concentrations from carbon emissions imply elevated global temperatures and changing climate in the, the coming decades. Um, natural da disaster risk has been on the rise and changing climate means we're likely to see more of climate induced natural disasters. So that could be fires, floods, hurricanes, et cetera. Um, additionally, climate change and climate risk can affect the economy through both physical and transitional risks. So physical risks are sort of those risks associated with the natural, natural disasters and transitional risks are sure shifts in the structural structure of an economy. So to what, what sectors rise and fall as, as climate changes. And lastly, the, the financial sector is becoming more climate aware, sort of bringing those risks on board in, in how they do their own work. So to start off, I thought I'd sort of set the tone. The, the broad theme for this presentation is sort of risks from climate change. There are some opportunities, which I'll discuss later on in the presentation, um, but just sort of keep, that, keep the, the risk dynamics in the back of your mind. So climate related natural hazards pose regional economic risks. So we've been in a global pandemic over the course of the last year. And one of the things that may have gotten overlooked in the news cycle is that we also had one of the largest um, climate induced natural disaster years in uh, the US history. So this, this map shows a, a map of natural disasters that had a billion dollars of loss or greater in the United States um, over the course of the past year from NOAA's billion dollar disasters data set. And as you'll notice, we, we had a number of hurricanes on the Gulf Coast and the East Coast and a series of natural disasters, storms and tornadoes in the central US, as well as some droughts and fires in the Western United States. 
So from an economics perspective, as we think about climate risks and climate change, uh, this is sort of broadly, it has a, has a large effect on the national economy, but more specifically, you have these sort of idiosyncratic risks on the natural disaster side that affect sort of local economies. And as I talk about transitional risks later on in the, the presentation, those also have a regional effect. So big picture on climate change, uh, greenhouse gas effects, carbon cycle and climate change. Um, this is probably something that most of the teachers on the call here are already well familiar with, but I thought I'd just sort of start with that and then move into some of the climate risks and sort of the economic perspectives. So the, map, the chart on the left-hand side or the image on the left-hand side is a diagram of some of the drivers for, for climate change. So we have the greenhouse gas effect and sort of the exchange of energy on the planet um, the sun sort of warms the warms the earth, and then some of that energy sort of gets released back out and back out into space, and some of that is trapped by the atmosphere. Um, human activity on the right hand side releases greenhouse gases, trapping some of that energy, um, causing you know incremental global warming. And additionally, human activity and sort of land use also changes. Um, sort of what, what is called the surface albedo or how much energy is sort of absorbed or reflected by the Earth's surface. Um, so, you know, cities, roads, et cetera, you know, absorb more heat than let's say, you know, forests or grasslands. Um, the, the chart on the, or the image on the right-hand side shows the carbon and biological cycle from the 1750s. Uh, the boxes are stores of carbon. So oceans, vegetation, soils, uh, fossil fuel storehouses. And then the arrows are carbon flows. Um, so human release of carbon through um, fossil, fuel, fossil fuel energy has sort of released carbon or released greenhouse gases. And those have largely been absorbed by the atmosphere and the ocean over the last, uh, last few hundred years, at least since the start of sort of the industrial revolution. Um, so the big takeaway here is that human activity is altering the planet and it's altering the climate. So what are we observing? We're observing rising greenhouse gas concentrations and also rising temperatures. So the chart on the left-hand side is um, data from the Mauna Loa Observatory um, in Hawaii, um, data going back to the 1960s. So this is the longest standing um, recorded direct measure of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. So we have the steady rise of carbon or steady rise in CO2 um, from, the, from, from the 1960s forward. And on the right hand side, we have global temperatures uh, overlaid with um, rising carbon dioxide. So this is deviations from the average temperature over the last hundred years associated and sort of the associated rise in carbon. So as you can see on the left hand side of the chart, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, carbon concentrations were relatively low. And then we had below average temperatures as carbon dioxide and sort of greater emissions sort of continue to increase. We have rising temperatures or temperatures above the average on the right-hand side. So the Earth's warming and that's you know, sort of associated or attributed to um, higher greenhouse gas emissions, higher carbon dioxide. So what's likely to come in the future? Uh, projections are for higher temperatures, uh, but there's also a lot of uncertainty with this. So I'll sort of can't, can't underscore the uncertainty component enough. Um, so the image on the left-hand side shows um, global projected temperatures um, over in the passes on the left-hand side in, in, in the gray. And on the right-hand side, we have some projections for global temperatures underneath a series of greenhouse gas um, concentration scenarios. So in the scientific world, um, the greenhouse gas concentration scenarios, low, medium, and high, are called representative concentration pathways. So that'd be R RPC 2 point, RCP 2.6, you know, 4.5 and 8.5. So scientists are projecting that we're likely to see higher temperatures in the future over the next, you know, 50, 100, 150 years. Um, but there's a lot of uncertainty associated with those projections. So when the scientists do their projections on future greenhouse gas emissions and greenhouse gas concentrations, that's largely associated with um, human activity. How, what, what, what fuels our economy? Is it fossil fuels or renewables? Um, what growth is there going to be in global economic activity? Um, so as you can see in the low, low scenario, um, that would be R RCP 2.6. That would be a scenario under which we reduce carbon emissions or begin to se sequester carbon. 
Um, the median scenario is the most likely scenario or where it seems as if we're, we're at as a, as, a, as a culture or as a, as a global community. Um, most of the gar carbon concentration estimates would suggest that we're on that path currently given sort of transitions in the energy sector, et cetera. And then that upper scenario was what uh, scientists called the business as usual case. That would be the scenario under which we continue to fuel global growth and the global economy strictly with fossil fuels or coal, electricity, et cetera. Um, and the evidence would suggest that we're likely not on that path and much closer to that median scenario. The chart on the right hand side shows global mean sea level rise, also attributed with those low, median, medium, and high greenhouse gas concentration scenarios. So this is one of the most more notable coastal natural hazard risks. Um, yeah, and similarly to what we have with um, you know, uncertainty in global temperatures on each of those concentration pathways, we also have uncertainty in sea level rise for coastal communities. So with rising temperatures and um, sort of rising seas and sort of a change in the climate, we're also seeing a rise in natural disasters. So I showed you the image or that uh, sort of stylized fact on what happened in 2020. This is the same data set from NOAA, their billion dollar disasters data set uh, that goes back to the 1980s. So the green bars are natural disasters which had a loss of a billion dollars or greater um, in counts. And then the blue line is the total cost of those natural disasters um, over the last um, you know, 40 years. So as I look at this chart, there's a, there, there's, there's a few things worth noting. Uh, one, the incidence of high dollar value disasters, those really big disasters, has kind of been on a steady rise over time. There's ebbs and flows year to year. So sort of big changes in the counts. But you know, if you look at it over, let's say five-year windows or 10-year windows, we have this rise in natural disasters incidents. And then the blue line is really interesting from an economics perspective because of the volatility of costs. So we see these large spikes in natural disaster costs um, within a given year, typically attributed to one or two really big or really costly natural disasters. So I've tagged a few of the, the bigger spikes in recent years. Um, in 20, 2017, we had Hurricane Harvey, Maria, and Irma, as well as some California wildfires. In 2012, it was Hurricane Sandy and the Midwestern droughts. And then in 2005, we have uh, Hurricane Katrina um, causing a lot of the costs associated with that year's natural disasters. So from an economics perspective, um, we think about the physical costs, the natural disaster costs and the natural disaster effects of climate change. But we also think about it in terms of transitional risk or changes in economic activity or changes in sort of sectors of the economy. So climate change has a variety of risks, but also opportunities and climate change may also pose risks to the financial system. So this is a, a chart on how um, economists as well as um, financial folks are starting to think about or establishing a framework for climate risks. So on the left-hand side, we have risks. On the right-hand side, we have opportunities. So as I discussed, with rising temperatures and changing climates, there's a number of physical hazard risks or changes in the physical world. Those are typically categorized as acute and chronic, similar to um, you know, acute and chronic diseases. So acute risks would be short, idiosyncratic events, um, hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, and then the chronic risks would be something that's slow and steady like sea level rise or longer dated droughts or higher temperatures. On the transitional risk side, we have a series of subcategories in there, but these are typically associated with shifts in economic activity or shifts in industries. So one aspect of transitional risks would be the movement away from fossil fuels towards, let's say, the renewable energy sector. And on the opportunity side, similarly, there's a series of subcategories, but one example of an opportunity would be a rise in the electrification of vehicles or the changeover in the transportation sector, or again, those shift to sort of renewable, um, renewable sectors of the economy. So a few words on climate risks. So I'm talking about this, but there's also a number of people across the Federal Reserve System who are also leading the charge on better understanding climate change and climate risks as it relates to the economy. 
So Kevin Stiro out of New York, you know, climate change has a significant, significant consequences for the US economy and the financial sector through slowing productivity growth, asset revaluations and sectoral reallocations of business activity. To sort of unpack the Fed speak there, you know, productivity growth would be, let's say those natural hazard shocks causing disruptions in supply chains or manufacturing facilities, or maybe higher temperatures, maybe making it more difficult to work outside in the summers. Asset revaluations, that's something as simple as people saying, hey, maybe I don't want to live in this risky area of the country where hurricanes are going to happen every five years or my house is going to get flooded. And then the sectoral reallocations, that's again, that changeover in industries, maybe a shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Um, you know, Mary Daly out of San Francisco, it's, it's basically our job to understand things that affect the national and regional economies. Climate change is one of those things, and we need to be mindful or aware of how that's actually having an effect. And then lastly, um, Lael Brainerd from the Board of Governors, a call to action for you know, research and awareness. So investing resources and understanding how climate change um, affects you know, financial stability or asset markets or regional economies. So we, I talked about um, physical risks. Um, this chart shows coal production in the United States, which has been on a steady decline and is one illustrative example of transitional risk um, in the United States. So slow and steady, our energy sector has shifted away from coal production and coal consumption into natural gas and renewables. Um, so we've seen roughly a 40% decline in coal production in the United States over, over the last uh, 20 years. Um, coal is one of the most carbon intensive or greenhouse gas, largest greenhouse gas emitting sort of types of energy production that we have in the US or even across the globe. So on one hand, sort of a shift away from coal is reducing carbon, but that's also creating disruptions in certain segments of the US economy and certain states economies. So places like Wyoming, which is within our district, as well as West Virginia, they're both big coal producing areas of the country. They have entire supply chains and economies that are built up around this. And you know, for worker coal miners and sort of workers who are, who've been in those industries for decades, it can be a real challenge to switch from you know, coal mining to some other segment of the economy. So when economists think about you know, a changeover from let's say coal to other types of energy, we need to be aware or sort of are becoming increasingly aware of how that affects specific regions, counties, um, sort of areas of, of the US economy. And that sort of raises the question, um, you know, issues of equity and transitions and what does just transitions look like for um, certain segments of the economy. Um, on the other side of the house, the transition away from coal is resulting in a rise in renewable energy. So as costs for renewable energy have declined and policies have been put in place to build those segments of the energy sector, we're seeing a rise in renewable energy and the associated industries around those. So on the, on the chart on the left-hand side, we have the sort of breakout of um, sources of energy for the electricity, electricity generation in the United States. So the black, black area is coal, the red is nuclear, the green is renewables, and the blue is natural gas. So over the next 30 years, the Energy Information Agency, the Department of Energy is expecting a steady decline in coal consumption for electricity production in the US. Nuclear is gonna remain about the same, and then there's gonna be this large wedge or this, they're expecting a large increase in the renewable energy sector, um, mostly wind and solar. And on the natural gas side, that should be about the same as it is today. On the right-hand side, we have US renewable electricity generation and sort of the projections over the next 30 years. So hydroelectric is going to be roughly about the same, not a big crease, increase in geothermal, but there'll be this large increase in wind and solar, mostly solar over the next 30 years. Um, so when an economist or an economics researcher looks at that, you know, it starts to raise the question, what are the supply chains going to look like? Where are the manufacturing facilities going to, or where are the manufacturing, ma manufacturing facilities going to be? Um, where is there going to be a change in labor, an increase in construction workers for wind farms, et cetera? I'd mentioned um, the decline in coal production in the United States and Wyoming 
It's also worth noting that Wyoming is also building one of the largest wind farms in the country. So there's these interesting sort of local dynamics when we think about that handoff between legacy um, industries and sort of the rise in you know, climate adjacent industries like the renewable energy sector. So I wanted to finish up with um, some of the work that we've been doing here at the Kansas City Fed. Um, so this is, these are some images from a paper that uh, myself and a few of my colleagues at NOAA um, sort of put together uh, on a project we did with uh, sea level rise and housing market impairments across the United States. So the takeaway here is that conducting climate economics research, it's, it's a pretty complex endeavor. Um, we, for this project, we brought on a climatologist from NOAA and a geographer from NOAA, as well as myself and another one of my colleagues, uh, Jacob Dice in Kansas City. Um, the map on the left-hand side is uh, Miami or the area of Miami that we analyze for single family home markets. Uh, so we analyzed about a half a million properties just in Miami alone and about 3.4 million properties across the United States. And the image on the right hand side is the sea level rise versus time uh, for the city of Miami. So I, I mentioned um, those greenhouse gas concentration um, pathways. We analyzed the low, medium and high scenarios that RCP 2.6, 4.5 and uh, 8.5 um, for each specific location. So that's the map of sea level rise over time for each of those scenarios and then the the associated uncertainty for those sea level rise trajectories. And we're hoping we find some results that'll be useful for city planners and policymakers. Um, so we basically mapped sea level rise and the properties found out when they would get inundated. The uh, tile on the left hand side, side shows the counts of property impairments over time. And the uh, chart on the right hand side shows the associated value of impairment again underneath those greenhouse gas concentration scenarios, low, medium, and high with the uncertainty bands. And one thing that we learned with this project or kind of new going in is that quality data and a cross-disciplinary approach is really important. So again, we brought on scientists and climatologists to help us out with this project. And you know, frankly, we wouldn't have been able to do it uh, without them. So economists there need to sort of work closely with scientific counterparts in order to do this type of work well. Um, and then the data sets that we worked with were really big, complex data sets. So these large spatial data sets across entire cities or entire states. And NOAA, NOAA's got a couple different versions of this. So one of the things that we did with this project is we used a combination of shape files, which are area files of inundation broken out into you know, one, two, three, and four foot increments, as well as a gridded data set, which is little tiles of spatial information that tell you the exact height above sea level for an individual 10 meter or 30 by 30 meter tile. Um, using the combination of these data sets, we were able to find out a more precise um, height above sea level rise or at least inundation height, and also the timing of when those properties might be inundated or might sort of be face you know, sea level rise or water at the door. So the chart on the right hand side shows um, what the impairments would have looked like if we just would have used those shape files or those one, two, three or four foot increments. And then what we found in the project sort of using the combination of data sets, both shapes as well as those, those little tiles. And as we do this work, it's, it's really important to have some humility as you go through this because it's amazing how much we might know as economics researchers, and then also how much we have yet to learn um, in working with other scientific disciplines like climatologists and scientists and geographers. So this is a, a cartoonish version of Miami's coast, um, looking at what natural levees are, that little mound on the left-hand side and sort of rising sea level and sort of how you need to have sea level rise change in order to inundate properties on the right that might be protected by these natural barriers. Um, I put a, a little link in the bottom right hand corner of the of this uh, of this slide. Um, you might consider sort of looking at that. It's a it's a video by one of my co-authors, Jacob Dice, who sort of breaks down the complexity of the work that we do into something that's really simple and sort of kind of fun to look at. So in summary, climate change poses risks to the regional and national economies. Um, we have both those physical risks, those natural disasters, as well as those transitional risks, the changes in sort of economic activity or industries. 
Those need to be taken into consideration as we better understand the effects of climate change. Um, climate change economics is an evolving field. And as economists, it's, it's really wise for us to work with, closely with scientific counterparts to understand the science and sort of the associated risks. And lastly, the Federal Reserve, along with other global central banks, is sort of working in earnest to better understand climate risks and sort of the associated economic effects. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Hey, David, thank you so much. And actually, I do have a few questions for you. Um, you, you know, what made you decide to study climate change in the economy? So this is a great question, Stacey. It is kind of a serendipitous series of life events. So as you mentioned, I worked for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for five years prior to going to grad school and learning about energy economics. And sort of it's that merger of unexpected sort of um, backgrounds or experiences. So you know, I worked on a ship in Alaska that studied fisheries as well as oceanography and climate. And then I found myself studying the energy economy and oil and gas and renewables. And these are sort of complementary backgrounds that when you put them together, you, you can sort of take some of the climate science and then understand what um, sort of economic transitions are going to look like um, in certain segments of the economy. So it was just, it wasn't something I'd planned. I just, I felt like I almost stumbled into it, but I'm, I'm grateful to sort of, you know, use those, use that background to, to some effect. Great. And that's uh, fantastic for the educators to serve their students. Sometimes you stumble into stuff and it really turns out well. So I'm not going to be a downer on this, but some of the stuff you presented is kind of depressing and adds um, maybe a twist to dismal science studying. What gives you hope with this? Well, I, for, for me, the biggest hope comes in how quickly things are happening. So that chart that I showed on renewable energy transitions, I think is really telling. So more so than any other time in my life, I mean, even five years ago, I, I was far more depressed about this than I, I am today because I'm seeing what's happening with sort of the electrification of the transportation sector or what's happening with um, sort of a rise in climate awareness across the financial sector. So there's entire segments of economics and sort of finance that are sort of quickly bringing this information on board and making decisions with it. And that's, that's somewhat inspiring. So it's a combination of how, how quickly things have happened, let's say in the last few years, as well as that growing awareness in areas of the economy where people are actually doing something with information that's been sitting on the books or sitting in the, the research papers for cli from climatologists for the better part of four, 40 years. So, and also sort of younger folks getting involved with some of this. So I, I think there's a lot of growing awareness with people in younger generations where it, it won't be something that you have to struggle with. It'll just be something that is. And when you have that, it's like, well, what do I want to do with that? Or what career do I want to go into? Or what do I want to study? And I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities in that regard as well. So kind of along the same line. So obviously um, the region that we're in has a lot of energy, uh, more of the traditional side that we're used to. Have you heard of anything that local economies are doing to shift uh, to, you know, a different sector, job training, and, you know, how long do you think some of these states will take to just diversify? Um, so it's, the diversification is already happening. So if, if we take like the mining sector and as an example, and sort of the decline in coal um, in Wyoming, um, Wyoming also has, you know, other forms of mining and sort of critical materials that are associated with the electrification of cars. So there's sort of these adjacent, similar types of activity. Um, taking Wyoming as another example, as I mentioned, um, they're, they're also building one of the largest um, wind farms in the country. So this is something that Nick Slides may be a little bit more familiar with, but sort of adjacent labor or sort of um, job types where when we see a decline in mining employment, a lot of those folks will find themselves in construction or in infrastructure or those, that, that type of work. Um, and when I think about Denver or Colorado specifically, um, we're just in a really exciting place because we have it all. We have 
you know, oil and gas and mining and all of these sort of legacy types of energy and economic activity, but we're also sort of one of the um, sort of front runners or leaders in the renewable energy sector. We have the National Renewable Energy Lab. We have some of NOAA's, NOAA, NOAA's lab facilities and some of the best climate expertise on the planet here. And we're also leading the charge or sort of moving quickly into the renewable energy sector. So there's a lot of you know, crossroads or sort of confluence of sort of the old and new taking place in Colorado specifically. And similar things also in New Mexico. Um, yeah, again, oil and gas and some transitions into the renewable energy sector as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I'll remind everybody, if you have any questions, please do put in, utilize the Q&A button and uh, we'll, we'll get to them. Um, hey, David, the, another question that did come in, is there an estimation as to how long fossil fuels can exist in large enough quantities to actually be of use to us? Or are, we, or are we really becoming green, hopefully? So that's a really good question. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an answer, but I don't know if it's 100% accurate. Um, so the, the assessment of available fossil fuel resources is, is pretty well established. You know, you have some of the major fields across the planet, um, you know, Saudi Arabia and the Guar field, some of the major drilling basins in the United States, that's both oil and gas. So geologists have known this for a long time, roughly how much is there. Um, I used to be concerned about depletion of fossil fuel resources. I think the conversation has largely switched into um, this concept of peak demand. So with this rise in electrification of vehicles and potentially of the, the shaving of demand or reduction in demand for let's say oil and gas, um, the conversation from an economics perspective is shifting towards what might happen if we don't need it anymore. What happens if we have more electric cars and we're just not putting as much gasoline through our, our gas tanks? And the, the, the concept in economics is called uh, basic stranded assets. You have it in the ground, but you may not use it anymore. This is, this is particularly important for coal. We're, we're no longer using as much for electricity or what's called steam coal. So there's a lot of coal that unless we find some other use for it that is not carbon emitting, we're unlikely to go continue to mine coal in certain areas of Wyoming for electricity. Um, so but that's my answer, long-winded answer to a very simple question. <laughs> well, maybe or maybe not, right? It, 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 I think a lot depends, I think a lot depends. David, uh, lot, I'm gonna, kind of jump into one last question before we bring on next slide. Do you have any recommendations for students um, that are concerned about this topic and these issues and maybe want to do something about it? Yeah, so that's a, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the energy of younger folks and sort of where they choose to allocate their, their time and focus. Um, so the, the national agencies like NOAA and USGS and NASA, they have some really good resources on this if you're just trying to learn and sort of understand what are the real issues or what are the real risks. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of emerging, changing aspects of the economy. So when I think about um, shifts in the transportation sector, I think there's gonna be a lot of opportunities, and this is me speculating or sort of surmising what the future might bring, but you know, a Tesla vehicle is a pretty complex piece of machinery that's gonna require skilled labor. And that might not necessarily require a college degree, but you do have to be smart and educated and, and these sorts of things. I mean, similar things are true in you know, the renewable energy sector. We might need fewer petroleum engineers, but might need a lot more people building infrastructure projects for wind farms and solar farms. So I would be thinking along those lines in terms of where do I want to position myself and what careers or types of education would I want to have in order to essentially make the world a better place or you know, shift into those areas of the economy that are growing and are sort of on the front end of those energy transitions. Hey, David, thank you so much. And I know this has been recorded and I know your PowerPoint will be available um, online shortly. You, you all will get an email letting you know when it's available. I appreciate your time, very interesting topic. Thank Our you next so much, presenter Casey. is Nick Sly. He's, no worries. Our next presenter is Nick Sly. Nick is gonna talk about the regional economy. And again, remember we're in the 10th district, so this is gonna, gonna encompass the, the middle part of America for, for sure. 
So with that, Nick, I would love to bring you up and have you share some, uh, some information. Stacy, thank you, glad to be here. Uh, as always, we, as we've gotten so used to saying this year, I wish we could meet in person, uh, especially as I see some colleagues, even some former students on the call, and, and very glad to have you join us. Uh, this year has absolutely been disruptive, but before I get started about the presentation, I want to thank uh, each and every one of you as educators of uh, being really an important part in the way that we manage uh, that disruption, and the way we manage it for our children who have had to go to school, uh, as we look forward to career and job prospects, as uh, folks in their formative years or in their teenage years thinking about what the future holds for them, they really do, I think, look to educators. They look to uh, the leaders that are often right in front of them uh, uh, for guidance and for insight and even sometimes a sounding board. And, and so in addition to all the conversations I think we want to have about what are the skills that you develop, what are the opportunities that might be out in front of them, um, I do want to recognize that uh, one important social aspect you, or social contribution you guys make uh, to your student bodies and you've had to do it yourselves being disrupted. So I think uh, I, I wanna start with, with that appreciation. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight. So David uh, highlighted uh, uh, what I think is a complex issue. Uh, and, and as many complex issues come up saying there's many different school uh, 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 talents, many different skills that we need, many different ways to think about it. It comes from, we need some folks who are very skilled with regard to political science. So we understand the social and governance aspects around uh, climate risk and how they're incorporated to our economy. We need some folks with strong data science skills to be able to uh, track and incorporate the information that we have that we gather from places like NOAA to be able to make real uh, assessments or real analysis. We need to be able to uh, digest that large amounts of information. Of course, we need finance, so we need some economists. Uh, we also need uh, uh, folks who help uh, frame the communications around what is a very difficult in, uh, issue a very complex issue to make it understandable, to make it relatable, and to, to make sure that it's part of, of, of a of regional, of a local, and even a national conversation. Um, so there's just such a variety of different ways to engage on that uh, on that issue when you think about just climate risk, and I think that's true for, for some economic issues more broadly. So with that, I think of an introduction uh, of thinking about the number of skills we want to bring. I want to try to tilt the lens a little bit more focused to think about some regional economic issues, um, and some of the things that I've been looking at over the last year. I will say that what's really uh, um, most profound, I think what you really recognize over the last year for these types of economic discussions is just how quickly they've been changing. Um, the, the economic issues and the challenges which are likely to be persistent really were uh, shifting from uh, weeks to weeks or from months to months uh, in the early part of the pandemic. Um, and now that we find ourselves with the prospect of a vaccine uh, coming out um, on the uh, backside of what has been a third wave of COVID-19, and we have some prospects for recovery, I think it's a little bit easier to turn our lens look a little bit more forward. And that's the conversation I'd like to have with you today. So in order to prompt uh, perhaps some questions and some of the uh, discussion that I hope we all have, again, please throw your questions into the chart, uh, your questions into the Q&A. Um, I'd like to present uh, a few of the things that I've been looking at in the last in the last several months. So as a general theme for the overall economic outlook, I think one thing you really want to do, you do want to recognize is how many different drivers, how many different factors are weighing on that near-term outlook. You know, often we talk about job growth and wage growth. We talk about the business investments that are out there or productivity. And right now we're talking about a number of other things things like economic stimulus in the form of uh, stimulus payments to households or PPP. We're talking about COVID cases or even the policies, the public health policies that have been out there. And when you have those additional factors on top of otherwise uh, economic factors, you really are in a situation where there's lots of uncertainty and that path of the pandemic saying so much more about the, the outlook for the economy than some of those other economic fundamentals. So where do we find ourselves right now? For the first time since the onset of the pandemic and really that, that initial uh, block in, back in April, where we, we saw over the course of summer some stabilization, we saw retail spending pick up, we saw some regains in employment, not all the way, but of course in employment. But over the last couple of months, for the first time, we saw a withdrawal. We saw uh, employment start to decline a little bit, particularly at restaurants and those leisure and hospitality businesses. And so that created a, a little bit of a gap between 
what was that near-term outlook, the conversation that we're having about what's happening right now and what's likely to happen in the next couple of months is weather and government restrictions, the increase in the number of cases really being a headwind to uh, uh, the near-term outlook. And then we had the, the prospects of a vaccine increase that optimism and, and raise expectations about what the medium to longer term outlook would be. And so a lot of the questions that we're faced with is how do we bridge that last legs of the gap? How do we get from a, a situation now where we're starting to see um, some softening and overall recovery to a point where we meet those, those elevated expectations for the medium to longer term? Okay. So if I think about those themes, let me try to uh, put some pictures to, to those words here. So what we're looking at in this chart is in the black lines, the number of COVID cases that you would see across the, the US. You saw that first wave in the early part of the summer, a bigger wave in the second part of the summer, and then of course, uh, the larger third wave uh, here in the winter months. And as you had those ebbs and flows in the waves of the pandemic, you also saw some changes or some shifts in the way in the overall economic recovery. And in particular, what we're showing here is for each of the states that sit in the 10th district, so much of the, the Midwest here, is the initial declines in overall retail spending that we saw at the onset of the pandemic. We saw the slowing of the overall recovery around that second wave of the pandemic. And then as we entered the third uh, wave of the pandemic, we saw an actual pullback as consumers were less confident about being out and about in the economy. There were restrictions that made it more difficult for them to go to restaurants or other places where you had to share space with other potential consumers. And also the weather made it a little bit harder to do that, particularly in some outdoor settings. So that close link between the ebbs and flows of, of the waves of COVID-19 and the overall prospects uh, for recovery. But I will say that there was a couple of significant differences between those first couple of waves and the economic scenario that we saw uh, really over the last couple of months. Initially, that pullback in retail spending was much more broad based. And in fact, the declines in employment, the associated declines in employment earlier this summer were also much more broad based. You saw many, many industries having their doors, uh, uh, businesses in those industries having their doors shuttered uh, temporarily. Um, we saw that at the advent, or sorry, at the arrival of the payment protection program that came out of the CARES Act, you saw in that second wave of COVID 19 that many of those businesses that had originally shut their doors were actually able to keep their workers on payrolls. But then you come into this third wave of, of COVID-19 that really came up in, in November and December. And rather than having a broad-based decline uh, in economic activity, a broader pullback in retail spending or a broader pullback in, in employment, what you saw was something that was a little bit more concentrated in what we call the leisure and hospitality sector. So this is your entertaining spaces, your event spaces, but also your restaurants, your hotels, and even some, uh, some resort locations. What I'm showing you here is data for Colorado that really is, is, uh, uh, serves as a nice example for what's happened broadly throughout the, uh, the Kansas City Feds district and even somewhat nationwide, was where you had over the last 30 years, if you looked at leisure and hospitality sector, you tended to see that in every recovery, so the gray bars are showing you recessions, following each and every one of those recoveries, the, the rate of job gains really didn't fluctuate that much. So we were adding somewhere between 400 and you know, 700 uh, jobs a month here in Colorado. So it's something like 8,000 uh, jobs over the year. In context, about 80,000 jobs that are still out outstanding. So give you a context of, of, of what that rate of, of typical recovery would be relative to the number of jobs outstanding. Of course, that's been much different than what you're, you're seeing right now is um, very quick and very profound uh, oscillations and, and changes in employment in this, in this uh, sector, the most affected sector. You did see employment in, in restaurants come back. Uh, you did see employment at, at some hotels to a modest degree, certainly not making, back, making up the number of jobs that were lost earlier this year, but you did see some of that employment come back relatively quickly, in fact, faster than, it, than you would have ever seen in that sector. But then at that third wave of COVID-19, it started to decline again. And so I think this, this, this graph says a lot about what are the prospects for recovery as we, as we start to look forward. Well, first, I think on a more optimistic note, is if you look at the, the quick changes, the rapid changes that we've seen over the last couple of months, we've seen that employment in places like restaurants and to a lesser extent in some places like uh, hotels, that you're able to bring, uh, businesses seem able to bring those jobs back relatively quickly. 
And so that I think uh, says that the prospects of a vaccine, the prospects of, of um, a shared community uh, uh, immunity um, and some protections that folks might be willing to be more out and about, might be more willing to share an armrest as they say, or sh uh, have some shared space. Certainly some, um, uh, the public health orders might be able to allow for more of that. And that employment might be able to come back fairly quickly. Now, maybe on a less optimistic note, I think also what's underlying uh, much of this, uh, these changes in employment is not just the consumers willing to be out and about and going to restaurants or going into these event spaces, but so much of this industry tends to be supported by business travel. And that means those large events, those conferences, programs, evenings like tonight, where we would have come together and we would have been in a, in a shared space, the employment that supports that type of economic activity really is looking to business travel return. Now, those are events that tend to take quite a while to plan, it takes some time to, to get into place. And so that fact says that maybe the prospects for recovery, if they're more like the typical rates that we've seen during, uh, following you know, previous downturns, it might be a little while. So I'm certainly watching the spring, what that spring break effect is, what the uh, consequences of the vaccine are for, for folks' willingness and ability to be out and about. Um, I think that's something we wanna closely monitor. Now, one of the questions that I think is important to ask when we think about this large sector of, of leisure and hospitality employment, these restaurants workers, hotel workers, events, entertainment workers, is if you think that the, the recovery of that sector could be delayed, that you think that those jobs might take a little while to, to recover, what are the outside opportunities? Where are the other places that those workers would tend to transition or other find, find other jobs? And what I'm showing you here is from the last uh, uh, economic recovery, so from the global financial crisis up until we had the COVID-19 pandemic hit, was to look and, and see when workers tended to, during that recovery, tended to leave the leisure and hospitality sector, where did they go? And these are the three biggest industries. So about 15% of them tended to go to retail, retail trade locations, yet about 10%, a little less of them going to like admin or support services or even some healthcare. And I think what's a particular challenge that we're facing right now is that not only is the leisure and hospitality sector continuing to be challenged and be affected by uh, the pandemic, these other sectors are also facing some headwinds. And that means that the, the challenges for workers are actually a bit more widespread than you might think, even though you've got, uh, um, uh, even though the, the consequences of the third wave of COVID-19 has been a little bit more concentrated to, to this segment. These are workers that tend to be lower wage. They tend to, uh, to be less likely to have um, uh, college degrees or even other advanced degrees. The workers that would be in these, in these populations often tend to have a little bit less in terms of overall savings. So it's, it's a significant challenge for workers that are otherwise in leisure and hospitality because the limited options for them to, to draw on savings or in limited options for them to transition to other industries uh, mean that these challenges can be pr quite profound with them. It also highlights how important some of the uh, economic stimulus and other fiscal support has been to support their spending uh, and livelihoods. Because that's a look right now at what we're seeing or what I'm trying to watch uh, in the labor market as we move into the spring is, is how is that leisure and hospitality sector going to recover? And I think another lens that you can have is not just the labor market, but to turn and look and see what's happening with businesses. And I would say that there's some interesting things um, uh, that are happening there that I wouldn't uh, claim to fully understand, but I think we want to continue to reach out to our business community, to reach out to um, our local communities to help us understand what are the challenges that are driving uh, the dynamics in this chart. So what you're seeing is for each of the states, the color lines for each of the states in our district, um, information from Opportunity Insights that tells us how many of the businesses or really what, what proportion of businesses have had to shutter their doors, close their doors, are not able to operate or uh, certainly not at full capacity. And really across the board, you're seeing that that's down to a significant level. You know, something between 20 uh, and 30% of businesses that were open prior to the pandemic um, are now uh, closed in, in, in one form or another. Uh, even in New Mexico, where it's, it's uh, closer to 45% uh, of those businesses that are down, particularly among uh, restaurants and other leisure hospitality businesses. Now that contrasts a little bit with another activity that you're seeing, which is in the black line, the number of businesses that are being formed throughout the district. So the new formation of businesses, um, you know, new requests for tax IDs, for businesses to continue operating independently. 
And so you are seeing some churning uh, in the business uh, community that we, I think we wanna continue to monitor going forward is that um, entrepreneurship, that ability to find new business opportunities uh, among households. These are often very small businesses. Um, that is, uh, suggests that workers may be looking for additional opportunities to transition uh, and find new employment or find new uh, um, means of support. Now, something else that I'm paying particularly close attention to really is to think about how, again, how businesses, not just labor markets, but how businesses are adjusting to this. And what you, you look is this pandemic is certainly, uh, this economic downturn is certainly very different than what we, we've ever seen previously. Uh, that's true for a number of reasons because of the financial situation we're in, the fact that we had record low employment when we came into this, that we had better capitalized banks. But one of the other things that's been different is how businesses have responded. Now, if you look over the last 40 years at each following uh, or look into each of the recessions, again, that's the gray bars here on the chart. What you see is that upon that recession, and, and, and as soon as those revenues started to drop and the, and the headwinds arrived, businesses really tightened their belt um, and they, they curtailed a lot of their investment. And particularly, uh, I'm just showing one example here, which is their investment in IT equipment. Now, that's not been true this time around. As we've had to support and go to remote work, as we've started to see um, businesses adapt and have to change the way that they're meeting the needs of the consumers, rather than pulling back on their investment and having, or even just going neutral, they've ramped up uh, the investment in that IT equipment. And they did so to the point where in the latter part of the year, you're getting almost uh, you know, three quarters of a percentage point of overall growth from that. And that sounds like a, a, you know, a number that's difficult to relate to, but you think about prior to the pandemic, as an overall economy, we're growing at about 2% of trends. So you think of you know, almost a, a full percentage point coming from just this type of investment. It tells you just how big and how significant this economic activity has been and how important this, this, this type of investment that businesses are doing has been to adapt and adjust and respond to the overall pandemic. And we are seeing that that type of investment is paying off for the businesses that actually are able to, to adapt. So what I'm showing you here in this chart is some responses from the surveys. This is the Kansas City Fed that reaches out to the community, reaches out to our businesses and asks questions about their revenue growth, their prospects for recovery, their employment and activity. But here in particular, we're looking at the revenue growth. And we, we really cut this into three different types of businesses. So on the right, when you think about all establishments, and you looked at over the course of last year, course a big, the, uh, amid the biggest economic downturn we had in a century, uh, here, we saw that all establishments on average, uh, on average had about a 15% decline in their overall revenues. That's the right bar. But that contrasts pretty starkly from the businesses they were able to adapt, either by expanding their online business, the left bar, which shows really those that expanded online business had much more modest declines in overall um, uh, revenue. Or even the middle bar there says for those businesses that adapted, invested in that IT, they changed their ability to meet their customers remotely. Um, those that added an online business actually had some revenue growth. And so when I look at the business community now, I'm seeing some of that adaptation and I'm, I'm trying to uh, gauge how, ab how able businesses are to adapt and what that means for their prospects to not just have their revenues grow, but to start to then bring workers back or retain workers and grow their businesses over time. Now, I wanted to talk about a couple of the significant developments that, that I'm trying to monitor when it comes to labor markets, really that focus on leisure and hospitality over the next couple of months, or when it comes to the business community, really looking at their ability to adapt and what that means for overall economic growth. Those are important areas, but another aspect of the Federal Reserve's mandate, uh, in addition to maximum sustainable employment, um, you know, the Federal Reserve has a responsibility to maintain price stability. And that's interpreted through a, um, a measure called headline inflation that looks at the basket, the typical basket of goods that a household in the, in the US buys and looks at how on average the price of that, that basket is actually changing over time. And so at a top level, if you think on average at a very, a very simple look, what you're seeing is that inflation is, uh, remains below that 2% target, that 2% growth in the overall price of the basket of goods that households are buying. Uh, that, that the FOMC, that the Federal Reserve targets, currently we're running below that. And I would say that the, the, the size, the magnitude of this shock, the composition of this headwinds means that we're likely to have inflation running below that 2% target um, over the medium term. But I wouldn't want to stop there and have that be the whole story when we think about price movements. 
uh, because the reality is when you look under the hood and when you start to look at different communities here between Colorado and Wyoming and other parts of the Midwest, when you look at the composition of goods that are purchased by homes and uh, households in New Mexico and other parts of the country, you do see some differences that I think are important for us to monitor. And I think they're important for us to connect to uh, real community leaders, to real households for, the, for them to help us understand. And I wanna show a couple of these. So first, sure, we had inflation slow on average so that you had the, the, level, the overall level of, of price growth uh, decelerate somewhat. But there were some key components where you actually had inflation accelerate at the, uh, at the onset of the pandemic. So what we're showing you in this chart here is think of the height of the bar is how much uh, prices of particular types of goods either accelerated or if the bar is below zero, how much they decelerated. So certainly things like energy, transportation, some furniture, um, some other business and personal care services, those, those things you really saw that slow down in the overall uh, rate of price growth there. But as you move to the right side of this chart and you start to think, look at things like um, cereals, when you look at fish, meats, seafood, when you look at household appliances and eggs, these are things where actually price growth picked up quite a bit. And that can be a challenge and an important thing to recognize for a couple of reasons. First, as we've gone to social distancing, as we quarantined at home, as we've started to work from home and really lived in, in our homes and gotten more out of them, um, we've certainly, uh, um, I think probably picked up the rate at which we're all doing dishes for sure, but we're also picking up the, the amount of money that we're having to spend on food at home. And as a result of that, when you see an acceleration in these types of prices, what you mean is that uh, you're actually seeing a, an additional burden from the, from the household expenses of buying food at home. But I think another important thing to recognize is that lower income households tend to spend more of their income on items on the right-hand side of this chart. They tend to send more of their income on food or on household items. And so you see the acceleration here in the prices of some of these goods as being felt a little bit more by low to moderate income households. And I think that's, that's something that's important to recognize beyond the, the average level of headline inflation in that typical basket. There are certainly some households that are having different experiences with this than others. There's another part of this that I think is, is, is useful. And I'm again, I'm showing the data here for Colorado, um, but this is something that's illustrative of what we're seeing across the district and across the region, um, and to, uh, to a greater extent, also across the country, where you see really two different experiences with the overall price of housing. Now, if you ask the top line and just say, what's happening overall in the country? What's happening with the cost of housing? You would tend to see that overall, that price growth is starting to decelerate. And that's really driven by the fact that rents are starting to slow down in terms of their overall growth or, or remain stable, uh, particularly here in Denver, but this is also true um, uh, across many major cities where you're seeing the overall price of growth as vacancies has gone up, that rental housing is becoming less and less expensive, or the, sorry, excuse me, that the, the rate of, of growth in, in rental housing is becoming um, uh, slower and slower. But of course that contrasts starkly with what you see in the green line here is that, you know, in 2020 is you didn't see a decline in the overall price of, of homes or homes for, to own. What you tend to see was a, actually a pickup, an acceleration um, in overall home values or the price of, of, of uh, the, the actual price of owning a home there. So how do you reconcile this? And again, to me, this is really illustrative of the different experiences that different households are having with the pandemic. If you look at medium and especially higher skill employment, our college educated employment or higher skill employment, you actually see that employment has returned overall uh, here in the region and, and to a large extent across the country has returned to what we had prior to the pandemic. But some of the lower skill employment, particularly that leisure and hospitality employment, you started to see, um, you, you see those number of jobs have not been fully regained. There's a large number of those jobs outstanding those households that are still most affected by the challenges in labor markets are also the households that are most likely to be renters and really have less spending power, less demand, less money to spend on rents. And that's why you're seeing that decline in rentals housing, whereas you're seeing uh, 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 some acceleration in, in the price of home ownership. So again, very different experiences that different households are having with the pandemic. And it's important, I think, to not just look at some of those top lines, it's important to get out, to talk to some households, to talk to community leaders uh, virtually most of the time, 
Um, but again, that again, highlights another issue, how important it is to be able to bridge a digital divide and connect with households who may not have access to join seminars like this, um, either through uh, digital divide or either through just not availability of having broadband access in some, some non-metro areas. For all the educators here, I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate the challenges of having to bridge that. So finally, one thing I do wanna say about housing is that where is some of that support that's coming, particularly for renters? If you look and you ask across the United States, um, how are they continuing to make their housing payments? We haven't seen delinquency rates pick up too much, but really where is that support for, for making their housing payments coming from? A substantial fraction of households are telling us that that support is coming from economic stimulus, not so much from savings or even some you know, retained income. Uh, and so to put uh, some specific figures on it here, if you look at the green bar, what it's telling you is a little over a quarter of the households uh, across the US, the same as tends to be true here uh, in the region, almost a quarter of the renters are telling us that a key reason they were able to make their, um, their housing expenses or meet their, their housing expenses is because they relied on economic stimulus payments. And to a lesser extent, we've seen so similar failures for things like unemployment insurance. So these things, these fiscal policies have certainly been important for households in maintaining uh, some of their housing security um, for pushing against the housing and, and food insecurity that they might have otherwise faced. Um, and has also been important for them to maintain their overall um, uh, level of livelihood. So in closing here, before we get to questions, which really I hope, I hope to take uh, a number of questions and comments from all of you, um, is when I look at what tends to be the, in the near term, the next several months, I'm really focused on uh, the leisure and hospitality sector and looking to see how quickly you would have employment uh, rebound in that industry. It is, of course, very closely tied with the path of the pandemic. There are some reasons to think that we might get a faster recovery in that sector than we have seen in previous uh, downturns. But that historical prospect for recovery, if we were to have jobs regained in that industry at the same rate we'd seen over the last 30 years, that could mean a more prolonged downturn and some more adverse challenges for, for, these, for the households that are in this sector. Moving from uh, the labor market to businesses, we're seeing businesses that are adapting, they're investing in equipment, they're transitioning uh, to support the new work posture. We're seeing new businesses form. And that I think is highlighting some optimism about that longer term outlook that if the vaccine can just get us there, if we have the consumer confidence return to just get us there, uh, that businesses are, are investing to be able to support that activity. And so what is that bridge? How do we get from there here to there? Uh, it really is how quickly that consumer confidence responds to the rollout of the vaccine, but also how many, uh, how much resources households have uh, to continue spending uh, even through what is remains an elevated level of unemployment. So with that, I will stop and I, I hope to take uh, any of your questions. Thank you. Hey, Nick, thank you. Um, as we know, the economy has been very um, interesting for the last 12 months, that's for sure. You know, you, you did mention leisure and hospitality um, employment is, is a key challenge. And of course, as we know, we, we, we live in a very beautiful region. So how does that, how does our region look compared to other parts of the country? I think we've certainly shared in the challenges of having declining in, uh, employment. I think we certainly shared in the challenges that uh, the latest wave uh, in, in November and December we saw the decline in employment just like we did in other parts uh, of the country. But I will say that there are some parts here locally, I'm gonna pick Colorado to start with, where you have a pretty diverse mix of, of, of leisure and hospitality employment. You've got some resorts, you've got some metro, you've got some restaurants that are associated with business travel, but also restaurants that are associated with uh, more consumer activity. And those differences I think can be uh, in helpful in for, um, uh, buffering against some of the downturns, but also in sort of uh, pro uh, providing some prospects for recovery. The region more generally, I think that there have been some states that have had a little bit less declines uh, uh, here in the Midwest in that leisure and hospitality employment. And so the, the need to have this faster than average, this faster than uh, um, what historical recovery in leisure and hospitality to get back to those peak levels of employment we saw prior to the pandemic isn't quite as big as it is as you look at the coastal cities, either west or east. And so in some sense, we, there's a lot of regional variation in how big the challenge is going to be in getting uh, leisure and hospitality workers back out and about. But the one thing that we all have in common is it's so dependent on consumers' confidence and ability to 
share those common spaces safely. Uh, and so I think we're all looking for that same thing. So talking about businesses, um, you know, have there been, have they been able to pivot? And if they have been able to pivot, what has set them apart in their survival? Are, are, or and or are people that are losing their jobs, are they starting something new? Yeah, I think I've been very, uh, uh, not maybe not surprised, but, but shocked, you see, that, that how quickly businesses were able to pivot. So if you ask them, I showed you data, how different it was uh, for businesses that didn't adapt and, and add an online business versus those that did. But I think what's underlying that is, is important to recognize, it's the overwhelming majorities of businesses that did actually invest in some online capability, that did adapt and change the way that they're gonna uh, uh, meet their customers' needs. And I think some of those are likely to be persistent changes that'll be part incorporated into part of their business strategies going forward. So it, they really did adapt quickly and, and, and in doing so, we're able to be a little bit more resilient. Of course, uh, policies like PPP that allowed them to retain workers, I think were, were important. Um, also, the economic stimulus payments to households to be able to continue spending, I think, were important in providing some of that buffer uh, in, in the initial stages of the, the initial phases of the pandemic. But when I, you're right, when you, when you think about where are some of those new businesses coming from, I do think it is, it's, it's a perhaps a bit opportunistic. It's, business, it's individuals, those that may have lost jobs or maybe aren't as adept at working in a remote environment or, or su supporting uh, working virtually are looking for alternative opportunities. And those come in the form of formation of new businesses and being entrepreneurial. Those things I think were much more elevated than we might've thought during a pandemic. You have that many businesses, right? You know, 20% growth in the overall number of businesses that were actually being formed is a very large number. So I think you see that entrepreneurial spirit, you see that adaptation. And so as we move out of some of those initial phases and away from some of that policy support, I think businesses, many are going to uh, be poised to actually uh, uh, be part of the recovery. Of course, the question then is, is we still have close to 20, in some states, 30% of businesses remain shuttered. Are they actually able to, to um, uh, reopen uh, and serve the new economy when it, when it starts to recover? Um, I think that's the question we want to watch is a lot of adapt adaptation. We want to ask the question is how broad and how inclusive that's going to be for, for the number of businesses in the country. Nick, um, what concerns does the Fed have with inflation being so long for so long? Um, some media have expressed some concerns. Are you concerned about this? Yeah, I think it's important. So they, yeah, I, I'd start with, you know, what is the Fed targeting versus what is too high and versus what is too low? Um, and the Open Market Committee, which is the, the group of the FOMC, it's the, uh, the Reserve Bank presidents and the Board of Governors, um, what they've chosen is that it, its target is a 2% inflation rate over time. So when we talk about too high or too low, what we're really talking about is that typical basket of goods that, that, that households buy, really, really pinned uh, uh, you know, the, the currency to the, the, the actual activities that households are engaged in. What they're looking at is, is inflation running persistently above 2% or persistently below 2%? So that's what it means, I think, to be too high or too low. Now, the question, uh, Stacey, if I understood it right, is, is what are the potential concerns about uh, inflation running persistently below that? And there's really a couple to, to I think, monitor there. So first, uh, if inflation is running persistently below 2%, so do the level of interest rates have to run somewhat uh, at, at low levels, or put differently, have to run closer to what we call the zero lower bound. And that's really that point where uh, the Federal Reserve in acting by to stimulate the economy to provide accommodation by lowering interest rates. When inflation runs low and the interest rates accordingly are very low, there's just less policy space. There's less potential for the Fed to really be able to support and smooth out some of those, those, uh, those downturns. And so I think that's uh, one of those persistent concerns that you have about inflation running too low below the, the Fed's 2% uh, target. Now there's another part of that though is is as markets start to expect, if you're, you're consistently running below 2%, if businesses and financial markets and households are consistently expecting inflation to run a little bit below 2%, then what happens is overall price pressures decline and you have to have inflation then move a little bit lower. And then you have expectations decline again and inflation is a little bit lower. And you really get to a point where expectations 
um, are making it very difficult for the, the Federal Reserve to maintain uh, policy space. So this is why I think the Federal Reserve, the Open Market Committee, has taken several steps either through um, what's called the Summary of Economic Projections, through its statements, uh, through the release of its transcripts, to be very clear about what its intent is, um, and even through its monetary policy strategy statement, uh, the committee has put out to say that it's targeting 2% uh, inflation so that those expectations can, um, for what overall price growth is going to be over the longer term, uh, really get fixed and anchored at uh, what the, the intended growth rate is, that 2% level. Great, Nick, thank you. Um, a couple more questions, fantastic questions. Uh, what kind of new businesses are being created as some are uh, eliminated, right, because of the pandemic? Yeah, I think this is a great question and something that, that I hope to actually uh, ask many of you that I hope to, to really understand through our public engagement, our conversations, that particular data, and this is often the challenge that we face when we rely on data and, and, and what we don't get from data, but we do get by talking to, to, to real people in the community is an answer to those types of questions. We see that the number of businesses that are filing for what is you know, a new tax ID, and that's really how we measure this. There's a, there's a form that helps us track it. We see the number of businesses that are forming, but what we don't really see is what sectors are opening those, uh, what, what sectors are opening up? Are these manufacturing businesses? Are they service businesses? Um, are they in rural areas versus urban areas? Are we tending to see more business formation by black and Latino households or white households? We don't get to see that type of composition. And it makes it hard for us to be able to answer those. And so I can't quite speak to that, but this is uh, the reason I, I wanna raise this, these data and the reason I wanna raise this issue is so that as we're out and talking to community members, uh, that they can tell us about the, their ability to participate in that, uh, that entrepreneurial activity, because it is really important for us to understand uh, if we think of this, this as that opening new businesses as an avenue for participating in the recovery, we want to know how inclusive that is going to be. Nick, uh, you opened up the, the question about interest rates um, and, you know, especially with, with inflation too. So the, what does, does the tool, Sorry, does the Fed have any tools to deal with the inflation rate, interest rate, and other problems that hopefully are on the horizon, but maybe? So this is a great question. I think it's something we, we um, want to make sure is, is, is really clear about is, is make sure that for myself, you know, having an understanding of what is that toolkit? What are the tools that you've got in the toolbox? Most often we talk about the traditional set, which is uh, the level of interest rates, right? Those short-term rates that really transmit to other parts of the economy. Lowering interest rates eases the debt burden. It lowers housing payments on mortgages. It lo lowers payments on cars, but also for businesses. It can lower uh, the expense of the, their operating lines. And that can really provide support and accommodation uh, for the economy. But I think the question is really after is saying is, as interest rates now are sitting near zero, what are the additional tools that are out there? And there's a couple that have been uh, deployed that have uh, names like forward guidance uh, or even uh, what we call the balance sheet, the size of the balance sheet. And forward guidance is, is in particular is really about interest rates, but it's not just what rates are today, that level of interest rates, but trying to provide some guidance and some clear expectations about what the path of rates is likely to be going forward. And so the committee, this open market committee that is responsible for setting the nation's monetary policy, have tried to provide some clear guidance that the level of interest rates that we have currently, this low near zero level, is likely to be maintained until the economy's made substantial progress on our objectives, until the nation has really reached a point where employment is reaching the level that, that the committee assesses nearing its or at its full and maximum level, that you're seeing some progress at prices are growing at that steady 2% on average. And so the four guidance there is being another tool is to say not just what rates are likely to be today, but really to provide that, that clarity going forward, that is until we've made that substantial progress, rates are likely to remain roughly somewhat where they are. So that's that forward guidance piece. The other part is, is when I'm talking about interest rates, I'm talking about mostly short-term interest rates, you know, and particularly the policy tool is the overnight rate that banks are charging one another's, but that's not the rate that, you know, we, we have for our homes or our cars or um, that the businesses have on their operating lines necessarily. There are some of those things like mortgages and bigger purchases that have longer term interest rates in those 15 year or 30 years and otherwise. 
And so how do you provide accommodation for uh, and support by lowering those longer term interest rates? And really what that's what the large purchases of treasury securities and mortgage backed securities, things that are called the balance sheet really are intended to do. They're intended to provide some support by lowering longer term interest rates. So to the question, I think this is a great one, which is what is the set of tools that are out there? There's a number of them. It's, it's the short term interest rate. And then there are the unconventional tools that are used in a crisis, which is this forward guidance and what is the, uh, the, the balance sheet uh, to, to lean on some longer term interest rates. And it's the combination of those that are really, uh, 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 the, the committee has been deploying to meet our employment objectives and really uh, help support price growth at the level it's desired. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, I got a couple more questions for you, but again, if anyone else has any, please type them in to the uh, Q&A. So the pandemic, um, obviously we have a wide variety of people watching tonight and they're from all different parts of um, our district and everybody has a little different public health order. You know, we know that may have curtailed we know it did curtail some economic activities. You've been monitoring those and what effects are you, are you seeing? No, I think it's an important aspect of where we try to understand the challenges. It's the pandemic as well as some of the other circumstances around us. And one of those has been uh, the public health orders that play such a crucial role in, in helping to limit contagion and the spread of the virus throughout the communities, but also have this other adverse consequence on, on economic activity. So I really, as I've looked at this, um, two things stand out is um, certainly between Wyoming, between Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, and really nationwide, each of those states have, have perhaps implemented different orders. Some cities have adopted the different ones. But even within a state, if you look within Colorado here, for example, there are some counties where only 20% of the, the employment in that county is what you would call as what was deemed essential or critical per those, those public health orders. Here in the Front Range uh, in Colorado, you have about half the workforce, but there are other parts of Colorado where you would have uh, you know, upwards of 80% of the population would actually be, of the, of the labor force, be employed in occupations that are deemed essential. On average, New Mexico would have a little bit less, for example. And so I think the first thing that really stood out to me is that even though the set of industries that was deemed critical in industry and those, the types of employment, was really uh, was roughly common across a lot of different places. There's a there's a bunch of variation even at local economies, and so those local experiences have been quite different. And I think those are important things we want to recognize. The second thing that I've really seen with regard to these orders is early on, these public health orders were important drivers, especially when you look like back in April or May, that you did see these disproportionate declines in spending or in employment in the areas, in those local economies, or particularly in those counties where you didn't have a lot of essential employment. But that hasn't been the same story as you moved later in the year, as you had PPP rollout that provided some support for uh, businesses to keep workers uh, on, their, on their workforce. As you had economic stimulus payments or unemployment insurance providing additional support, you didn't see those same disproportionate effects where local economies that, were, that had less essential employment also had the biggest economic challenges. And so I think, again, that was another feature of the economic narrative over the last year that highlights the, the, the combination of the monetary policies that come out, but also those fiscal policies that have come out to be able to provide support to households, how important they've been to supporting our local communities. And I think that was an important takeaway um, as we've watched these, these public health orders unfold over the last several months. All right, Nick, I've got one last question for you. And of course, this, this makes sense because you get a bunch of educators on the on the, the virtual tonight. How long do you think the lasting changes to the workforce and the economy will last and or will be reflected in education? And then of course, looking into your crystal ball, how do we prepare students uh, for future careers, uh, job fields as they enter the workplace? Uh, no, this is a great question. And, and Stacy uh, and for everyone, I wish we did. I think we all wish we had that crystal ball, right? To know what the new normal is gonna be, what that adjustment is gonna be and, 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 and where those, be those opportunities are gonna be. And so, um, you know, I always hesitate to speculate, but I think this is such an important question for how do we get to a recovery and how do we participate in it? So the first thing that I, I guess that I'm really looking for is to see that 
when we looked at the types of occupations that were initially hit, there was not a big mix, not as much of a mix between college and, and, and non-college. There's lots of opportunities that return fairly quickly for skilled trades. When we talk to businesses and we talk in the industry or when we talk to those in the service sector or manufacturing, we keep hearing about shortages of key workplace skills. So labor market, those skilled trades. And that was a story that was true prior to the pandemic, but also was true, even more true during the pandemic. And so as I think about a new uh, a recovery, I think there's a lot of opportunity in some of those skilled trades and some of those occupations. And I think there's a lot of potential for workers, uh, for individuals to quickly become, uh, become part of that. The second thing I think we really uh, have noticed is um, how important something like a universal education is and how much, how important the breadth of experience is gonna be. We quickly had to adjust the way we work whom we were working with and how we're doing it. And the ability to pivot and adjust that way, that comes up very rarely and hopefully within our lifetimes, but you know, inevitably comes up at some point is the education that supports that agility and that transition, the multiple different ways. So I always wanna pick out, it's not a single profession or it's not a single industry. It's not a major or even you know, a, a certificate program is being able to have a, a, a students who have that mindset that uh, agility, flexibility, university, the ability to connect to different parts of their community, how important that has been. Um, and we just see that, that those businesses, those households that could adapt and adjust, um, were able to be a little bit more resilient. And I think that's, that's an important consideration. Maybe not the skills you go after or the, the types of schools you enroll in, but the way that students view school uh, is going to be, I think, is very important. So uh, I always want to pitch that, that, that broad thinking and that ability to connect with, with other people that, that are perhaps in different segments of the, of the economy or different parts of the community, how important that is just for being able to adapt, adjust, and be resilient. Thanks, Nick. Thanks. This, is, this has been great. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And it also kind of ties into what David was saying too. Sometimes you, you stumble into it, but you gotta keep your ears, eyes open and continue to learn. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening. This was, this was fabulous. Uh, we enjoy doing the Evening with the Fed programs. Uh, I wish it could be, like Nick said, live in person. So we could network, we could laugh about uh, the good times, uh, what's going on in your classrooms. But until, until we get together next time, we just want to remind you of, can, again, our upcoming events, uh, please do take the opportunity to register and come back for some more very interesting topics and discussions. Also to let you know that uh, your certificates will be emailed to you for, for um, participating tonight. We also have a ton of resources out there for you to use in your classroom. They're all free. And then uh, because you're here tonight, you will be entered into a drawing for some fabulous prizes and we will announce the winners of those and get those in the mail to you shortly. With that being said, I'm going to wrap up for the evening. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.